Praise the Lord. Rise up as we pray together. Father, we do thank you for your people. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit always speaking to us. We're asking, O oh Lord, that today you speak your word to every heart in Jesus' name. Give us the spirit of understanding and to respond to your word the way people of old and people of the Bible days responded to your word in Jesus' name. Let the knowledge of the truth that you reveal to us prepare us for the coming day. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. We're looking at Matthew chapter 24. And I'm reading from verse 3, Matthew chapter 24. And we're looking at verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Here you find the apostles and disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ representing the church. And they came to the Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to know, three things, when shall these things be? You've spoken about the destruction of Jerusalem. And at this temple that we see, everything will collapse. What not one stone will rest on the other. When will that happen? Number two. What's the sign of your coming? We're sure now because we've said it over and over. We're sure now because we've read it in the Old Testament. We're sure because the Spirit of the Lord is impressing upon our hearts. You're coming again. And when shall that be? Number three, the end of the world. The end of this present age. When will that be? They wanted to know about the future. All this was still future. The destruction of Jerusalem, which has not happened, which has now happened, had not happened at that time. It was still future to them. And so they wanted to know about the certainty. And they wanted to know about the fulfillment of that coming to pass. And of course, it's coming again. The Old Testament repeats over and over. In prophetic language, it will come for the first time. He came already for the first time. And he knew that he will be coming again. That was still future. And this is still future. And of course, the end of the world. When will that be? Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness. And unto all nations. And then, tell me there shall the end come the lord confirmed the end will come it was still future but then he told them something must happen first the gospel must go around the whole world every community must have a chance to respond to the gospel either to receive the gospel or to reject the gospel but the gospel must be preached which tells us then that the church is not to fold its hand and be idly waiting. Waiting in laziness and waiting in idleness for the Lord to come. It says the gospel must be preached in all the world for a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. Verse 25, behold, I have told you before. Behold, I have told you before. A time of the end is coming. We're looking at Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 40. Matthew chapter 13, verse 40. And therefore the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire. So shall it be in the end of the world. Again, the Lord emphasizes here, the end will come. It's the age of the world, the age of the age. And the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend the sinners, and they 
which do iniquity, those wicked people, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. We're looking at verse 49. In verse 49, so shall it be at the end of the world. You see the repetition, end of the world, end of the world. There are people that live as if the world will continue forever. The people that live are saved. There's no end to pleasure. There's no end to sinning. There's no end to the activities of the world. But the Lord repeated over and over that the world is coming to an end. And it says, so shall it be at the end of the world. It tells us in that verse 49, the angel shall come forth and sever and separate and put apart the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And I will come back now to chapter 24 again. Matthew chapter 24, and I will read him from verse 32. Because the disciples, the apostles, the church, they were asking, what are the signs? How do we know so that we can get ready for that time coming? It tells us in Matthew chapter 24 verse 32, Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and put it forth the leaves, ye know that summer is near. It's saying from the natural, look at the spiritual. It says from the present, look at the prophetic. It says from what you know, look at what you don't know. When the fig tree is a blossoming and then you know it's this time, you know that summer is necessary. So likewise, verse 33, so likewise she, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the dawn. All these things, what does he mean by that? It's talking about earthquakes, it's talking about wars, it's talking about a distress of nations, it's talking about a lot of things. And it says when you see all these things happening, then you know the end is very near. Then you know all those prophetic sayings are soon to come to pass. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Somebody there says, Amen. Amen. Verse 42, watch therefore. You see that? He's saying, you learn this not just to put it in your head. Watch therefore. You're learning this not just to know something about the future. I know this about the rapture. I know this about the great tribulation. I know this about the millennial reign. I know this about the great white throne judgment. It says, the reason you know that is to watch therefore. For ye know not what hour your Lord does come. He is coming. He will come again. He wants us to watch. He wants us to get ready. So that when he comes, you will not be left behind in Jesus' name. We're looking today at the word of God concerning prophetic insight into the events of an imminent end. Prophetic insight. The insight we have. The knowledge we have. The understanding we ought to have concerning events of the last days. Prophetic insight into the events. Different things, events of an imminent end. Imminent, that means it's going to happen. Imminent, that means that it will happen very soon and it's going to happen suddenly. And then it's going to be the beginning of the end. When those things begin to happen, it means the end of the age, the end of the world. The disciples ask about, it means it's coming. And it's going to be very soon. As we look at all these events in the plural, and what we're waiting for now, number one, is the rapture. The rapture. Number two, after that, once the church is gone, there'll be the great tribulation. And that will take place for seven years. From the middle of the seven years, it will become serious, intense, unbearable, and something that had never happened in the world before. After that great revelation, Christ will appear again. He will now come. 
which is the second phase of his coming. The first phase of his coming is the rapture. And then he comes again. After the seven years, at that time, all eyes will see him. And those who crucified him, those who pierced him, they will see him. There will be a wailing. There will be a crying. There will be a shout. There will be sorrow because Christ is coming. On the one hand, the Israelites, the nation of Israel, will be so sorrowful that they crucified the Lord. At the end, they will turn to repentance. That will be for the that will be the reason for their wailing. But the gentle nations will cry. They will wail because a time of judgment has now come. Because he comes to reign. He comes to rule as the king of kings and the lord of lords. And then he'll establish his millennial reign. A millennium is 1,000 years. And so it will be 1,000 years of the reigning of the prince of peace. At the end of the millennial reign, then Satan again, who had been in the bottomless pit at the time of the millennial reign, he'll be released so that the people of the world, who are the world at that time that Christ met when he came the second time, and they will be given chance again to see whether they're going to respond to the Savior or to Satan. And then will be the battle of Armageddon. And then after that now, the Lord will settle the great white throne judgment. At the time of that great white throne a judgment, everything now will be brought to a finality. And it is that finality that now ushers us into the eternal realm of the future, which will be heaven for those who are children of God and hell for those who are, who are not children of God. And so we're talking about prophetic insight into the events of an imminent end. There are three things we're going to talk about. Number one is the rapture. Number two is the great tribulation. And number three is the great white throne judgment. Point number one, the suddenness of our glorious translation. The suddenness of our glorious translation. It will come suddenly. It will come unexpected to the world. It will come unannounced. It will come unforeseen. That's why it's sudden. The people of the world will not foresee this. Even the church, much of the church, will not foresee this unforeseen, unannounced, unexpected. The suddenness of our glorious translation. Point number two, the suffering during the great tribulation. The suffering during the great tribulation. The time of the great tribulation will be a time of devastation, a time of damnation, a time of doom, a time of terrible, unbearable, almost unbearable suffering. The suffering during the great tribulation. Point number three is the sentence of the great white throne judgment. The final sentence. How the Lord God of heaven, the Almighty, will speak to those sinners who remain unrepentant until that very time. After they have had chance upon chance, opportunity upon of opportunity upon opportunity to repent, and did not repent. And their names are not in the book of life in heaven. The final sentence. As God summons everyone before the great white throne. Number one now. Tell me number one. The suddenness of our glorious translation. Here is where the church comes in. And here is the privilege and the opportunity for those who know the Lord. Saints of God. Born again people. The people who have become new creatures in Christ and the living in expectation of the Lord's coming. We're told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 
First Thessalonians chapter 1, chapter 4 rather. First Thessalonians chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 13. But I would not have you ignorant. To be ignorant, brethren. He's talking to brethren. He's talking to those who are born again. He's talking to the beloved. He's talking to those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Those who have become new creatures in Christ, all things have passed away. All things have become new. He's talking to members of the family of God. And he says, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that she sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. If you have lost a beloved one, he says, don't be so sorrowful. And if you have lost somebody so near, so dear to you, don't be so sorrowful. It says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, even so, even so also, well, we, they also, them which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. For this we say, it's talking about all the apostles, we say it with one voice, we say it in unity of doctrine. We say it in unity of revelation. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Notice that it says, we're not just saying this because we saw something new, something that was never revealed before. It says, we say this to you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not proceed, prevent, shall not hinder them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The dead in Christ shall rise first. What happens when a child of God dies, his spirit and his soul goes to heaven? And goes to be with the Lord. You remember, Stephen, Lord, receive my spirit. But the body was left down here. And then you remember the old, the rich man, he went to hell immediately, the spirit and the soul. And then you remember Lazarus in that story that Jesus told, he went to Abraham's bosom. But now, this day of rapture, the dead in Christ. The spirit, their soul in heaven will not join the risen body, resurrected body. And then they join together. The whole man, the complete man will not be with the Lord. And it says, then shall we, shall we, we who are still alive, we who are children of God and who have not died, then shall we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, them who them the resurrected saints them those who are resurrected from the dead will be with them and then to meet the lord in the air you need to know that in the air it's not on the earth yet it's every eye will not see him at this and this rapture this rapture and it says will be with them in the air and so shall we ever be with the lord therefore comfort one another with these words that means whatever you are going through, you understand? It will not be long. Our Christ is coming. Our Savior is coming. And is coming for those who are children of God. I will go with them in the rapture in Jesus' name. You understand? You remember what uh, the apostle said? He said, we say this to you. We're telling you this by the word of the Lord. Word of the Lord. When did the Lord say that before this time by the word of the Lord? John chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 1. John chapter 14, reading from verse 1. And it says here in verse 1, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He was talking to the believers, not the disciples, the apostles. He was talking to the church. And he says, I go to prepare a place for you. That's for the church. Those who are saved. And then they have been cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. They have been washed white. Whiter than snow. Because their sins were taken away. Two areas of sin. Number one, the sins they committed. The blood of Jesus washes that away. And forgives us that salvation. The second part of the sin. The sin inherited. The damnic nature. The depravity of the soul. It takes that away to at the point of sanctification. And now he's talking to those people who are regenerated. 
the people who are saved and sanctified. And he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, understand, sin cannot enter heaven. And the depravity will not go with anyone to heaven. Otherwise, heaven will be just like the earth. If depravity goes there, if all the inherited sin goes there, if we're not cleansed, if we're not purged, if we're not purified, if we're not sanctified, we're not made holy, before we get there, heaven will be like the earth. That's why he saves us. Before we get to heaven, it sanctifies us. And then it says, I go to prepare a place for you. Look at this, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, tell me what follows. I can't hear a church. I will come again and receive you, not the whole world now, and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I will be there. Somebody there said, I will be there. You know, Enoch went there. That's a, that's a symbol and that's a picture of the rapture. The rapture, this translation of the people of God. We're looking at Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, that God took Enoch there without seeing death, a picture of the rapture. That's how he's going to take the people of God, those who are saved, those who are purified and those who are sanctified, those who live by faith, a holy life, a righteous life, it will take us to heaven at the time of the rapture in Jesus' name. And you remember that uh, Enoch went before the flood came. Enoch was raptured. Enoch was translated before the flood came and the church is going to be raptured before the time of the great tribulation. We're looking at Genesis chapter 5, Verse 22, and Enoch walked with God. After he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters, and all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. The translation, it was sudden. It was unexpected. The people around Enoch at that time, there was no announcement to them, I'm taking Enoch away. And there was no expectation of them, I'm taking Enoch away. Suddenly it happened in the same way the rapture is going to happen. And it's going to happen suddenly, unannounced, unexpected, unforeseen. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, and I'm reading from verse 5. I pray you'll be part of the people that will be raptured. By faith, chapter 11, verse 5, by faith, Enoch was translated. That's the rapture. It's also called translation. That's why we're calling this the suddenness of our glorious translation. It says, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He pleased God. His life pleased God. His Christian experience pleased God. His work day after day pleased God. His thoughts, the direction of his life, and the uh, kind of uh, conduct and character that he had, everything pleased God. His plans pleased God. Lie from day to day. And that's what's going to happen. If you are saved and you are a real child of God, then if your life pleases the Lord, on that wonderful day when the Lord shall come and the rapture will take place and the dead in Christ shall rise forth and we which are alive shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, living a life minute after minute and moment after moment, a life that pleases the Lord by the grace of God, in the promise of the Lord, you'll be part of the rapture in Jesus' name. In Second Kings chapter 2, we have another illustration of this rapture. We're looking at Second Kings chapter 2, and I'm reading here from verse 3. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth unto Elisha. And said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? For them, it was still future. 
It had not happened, but it was going to happen that day. And I wanted Elisha to know. And I wanted to ask Elisha, do you know something prophetic? Do you know something future? Even though it was still that day, it was still future. Do you know that the Lord will take your master away from your head today? And he said, yea, I know it, hold your peace. Those people knew, but it was an idle knowledge. They knew it, but there was nothing they prepared. There was nothing they were asking for. There was nothing they were saying. Before the man of God goes, let me have something. Look at verse 5. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. Here you find another congregation, another group of people in another city, another place, and they had the prophetic knowledge. Having the knowledge is not, is not enough. You must do something about that. The rapture is coming. Do something about that. The Lord will take his own people away. Do something about that. Don't just live from day to day. Do you know the rapture is coming? Yes, I know it. What are you doing about it? Look at verse 9. And it came to pass when they were over. When they went, when they went, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away. Taken away. That's the rapture right there. Caught away, caught up, taken away from thee. But the point is, Elisha here had a request. Elisha here had something he was doing so that that rapture of Elijah will not just uh, take place without his getting something. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of the Spirit come be upon me. We're looking at verse 11, and it came to pass, as they went on and taught that, um, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to where? Tell me out loud. Is there a heaven? I said, is there a heaven? Yes. yes, there's heaven. And Elijah went to heaven. We'll see the case of Enoch, a type of rapture. We'll see the case of um, Elijah, a type of the rapture. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. And I'm reading here from verse 8. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Look at this. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. He was taken up. This is about the Lord Jesus Christ. In the case of the Lord Jesus Christ, he had died. And then he rose again. He appeared to his own disciples those 40 days after that resurrection. And now he was giving them the final instructions to wait at Jerusalem until they were due with power from on high. And while he said that, when he had spoken that, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward, tell me, Tell me out loud, toward heaven. Rapture takes us to heaven. You know, those people that sell whatever they are selling literature, they say they want to live on this earth forever. Heaven. Everybody shout heaven. heaven. You'll get there in Jesus' name. It says, while they look steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, as he went up, behold, two men, these were angels that came, stood by them in, in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into, tell me, heaven. It says, this same Jesus. 
the one who died on the cross of Calvary, the same Jesus, the one who was buried, and then on the third day rose again, the same Jesus, the one that appeared to his own disciples and assured them, in my father's house are many mansions, I go to prepare a place for you, and as I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, so that I can receive you to myself, that same Jesus, the same Jesus, which is taken up from you into, tell me, I want you to be registered in your heart. That's why it says, tell me. Taking up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into, tell me now, into heaven. He went to heaven, is coming again. And is coming to take his own children. You will not go through the great tribulation. All the suffering of that time, once you are up, you'll be up there looking at what is happening here on earth. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm reading here from verse 51. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 51. It tells us in verse 51, behold, I show you a mystery. What many people do not know. Behold, I show you a mystery. What is hidden from the knowledge of the people of the world. Behold, I show you a mystery. What the old time, all the Old Testament people did not know. It was a mystery. It is now revealed unto us. They knew about the second coming. Enoch spoke about that. It was an Old Testament saint. He said, Christ will come. The Lord will come. And he's going to come with tens of thousands of his saints. And he's going to judge the world. That's the judgment. That is the second coming. They knew about that was not a mystery to the people and the prophets of Israel. But now the rapture. The church came in between, in between the first coming and the second coming. For those Old Testament people, it was a mystery. That's why Paul the Apostle said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall not all die. But, 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 we shall all be changed. He's talking about the church, the saved church. It's talking about the church, the sanctified church. It's talking about the church, the steadfast church, the one that endures to that very time. Because the love of many shall wax cold. But thank God, my love will not wax cold. They that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. It's talking about the saved church. It's talking about the sanctified church. It's talking about the steadfast church. The people that will endure to the end. And it says, we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, that for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise forth. And then he goes on to say, and then, and tell me, I said, and what? The dead shall be raised incorruptible. Are you with your Bible there? Okay, tell me the last part of verse 52. And we, I'll be there. I said, I'll be there. You'll be there in Jesus' name. That's what the believers are supposed to do. We're waiting for the coming of the Lord. Once you are born again, once your life is transformed, you're waiting for the rapture, which will take place any time from now. First Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we urge unto you, and that ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. Look at this. And to wait, and to wait for his son from heaven. Those are believers waiting for the rapture. Waiting for the coming of the Lord for the church. And waiting for the pe for the Christ that will come. For the people who are saved. For those who are sanctified. For those who are made holy. For those who have all the remnants of sin. Cleansed away from their lives and from their hearts. And to wait for his son from heaven. Whom he raised from the dead. Even Jesus which redelivered us from the wrath to come. From the wrath to come, we're not going to be a part of that wrath. We're not going to be a part of the great tribulation. The rapture will take place before the great tribulation. It tells us in First Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 9. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. For God has not appointed us to wrath. 
The great tribulation is not for the church. The rapture is for the church. For he has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation, to obtain deliverance by our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 3. And here we're reading from verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, you are born again, you are saved, you are sanctified. If ye then be risen with Christ, the old man is crucified. And then you come to live in newness of life. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth see that if you're here about the rapture do something about that let your mind be in heaven let your heart be in heaven let your ambition be in heaven let your aspiration be in heaven set your heart on things above not on things on the earth on uh, you know the mundane things of the world it says no that you set your heart on things above for ye are dead and your life is seen with christ in god look at this when christ who is our life shall appear. It's talking about the rapture now. It says, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. You'll be there. I said you'll be there. Titus chapter 2, the rapture is going to take place. And those who are saved and sanctified, I pray that God will make you ready. I said the Lord will make you ready. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldliness and their worldly laws. Let us, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. While we're living godly, righteously in this present world. Look at verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope. At the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That is, we're looking for the time of the rapture. We're getting ready for the time of the rapture. It may come in the day or in the night. It may come on Sunday or on Thursday. It may come anytime. Anytime. It may be when you're in the bus. It may be when you, you know, think, you know, there's not church time. And then you want to do some uh, things that shouldn't be done. We do not know when the Lord will come. And because it will uh, come, uh, come suddenly, that's why it says, looking, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from uh, how much of iniquity? Tell me out loud. Is it possible to be saved from sin? Not to have any sin in our lives? To have internal sin, external sin, every kind of sin taken out? Is that possible? Is it possible to live without all those, you know, falling and rising, falling and rising? Is it possible? It will happen to you. It has happened to you already. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, lazy, idle, lethargic, lukewarm, sluggish, Come on, look at that, tell me. Talk about yourself now, tell me. Say that again. Zealous of good works, zealous of good works. You know, so somebody was asking, uh, why is uh, cry? Why has Christ not come? Is it because people are waxing cold? Are you waxing cold, somebody there? The coldness of the age is catching up on you. Zealous of good works. I'll be zealous for the Lord. I said I will be zealous for the Lord. It tells us in First John chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not. Because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God? And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know. Thank God I know. I say thank God I know. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. He's talking about the rapture there. And every man, every man, everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he 
is pure. I'll be you be a partaker in Jesus' name. After that translation, after that rapture, will be the time of the great tribulation. Actually, Jesus Christ, in answering the question of the disciples, the apostles, and the early church, mentioned those words, the great tribulation. We're coming back to Matthew chapter 24. And this is point number two now, the suffering during the uh, great tribulation, the suffering during the great tribulation. We're looking at Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation. Listen to this. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be nor ever shall be. It's talking about a special period, an intense period, a very dangerous period, a destructive period, a time of terrible suffering. And Jesus said, until the time of that great revelation, all the sufferings of the world put together, pile everything together, there's never been any suffering like that. And then after that time, there'll be no suffering on earth like that anymore. It tells us in verse 29, look at verse 29 of that same chapter, immediately after the tribulation of those days, this shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give the light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Look at this. After the tribulation, after the tribulation, then shall appear a sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. It's telling us that the rapture takes place first. After that, the great tribulation. And that's going to be a time of terrible suffering. And then, after the great tribulation, seven-year period, then uh, will be the coming, uh, uh, the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. You see, that great tribulation, that's not a mystery. The Old Testament people knew about that. They knew that a time of the great tribulation will come. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, I was reading from verse 30. Deuteronomy chapter 4, we're reading from verse 30, telling us about the great tribulation, the time of trouble, trial coming for the children of Israel. Verse 30, chapter 4, Deuteronomy, when thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days. It's not uh, the trouble they saw in Babylon. Even in the latter days. It's not the time they saw the time of General Titus when Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed. This will be in the latter days. Even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shall be obedient unto his voice. And then it goes on. It's giving a promise to the children of Israel. They'll have the chance at that time chance to turn to the Lord chance to repent at that time because that's the time of the Jews the time of the nation of Israel let's come to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 30 and I'm looking at it from verses 6 and 7 Jeremiah chapter 30 and we're looking at verse 6 and verse 7 still talking about the period of the great tribulation the time of suffering and a time of real devastation upon the land of Israel and the rest of the world. In Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 6. As ye now and see whether a man does travail with child. Because um, you, this uh, Jeremiah is seeing the men in, a future, in the future. He's seeing them in prophetic vision. And he sees the men as if they were labor pains. Unbearable pain. And he says wherefore do I? I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail and all faces are turned into paleness alas for that day is great so that none is like it isn't that what Jesus said that day is great a time of suffering a time of great wrath 
Wrath coming from Satan. Wrath coming from the Antichrist. Wrath coming from the Almighty God Himself. All piled on the people of the world at that time. And it says at the time of wrath. It's, there's none like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it at the end of seven years because the tribulation will not continue forever. That's what Jesus said. Except those days be shortened, no flesh shall be saved. But because of the elect, because of the Jews, because of Israel, and because of the people that he has in mind that is going to rescue them at that time, he says that time will be shortened to seven years. Look at Daniel chapter 12, that time of the great tribulation. Daniel chapter 12, and we're looking at verse 1. In Daniel chapter 12, reading here from verse 1, and at that time, what time? The time of the great tribulation, the time of that great suffering, the time of unprecedented suffering, a kind of suffering that had never been in the world. And all the people who are not saved, all the people who are backsliders, all the people whose love has waxed cold, and they remain on earth after the rapture, they will go through this time. I will not be a backslider. I said, I will not be a backslider. And you'll not be on the earth at this terrible time in Jesus' name. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble. Look at this. Such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time the people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. Everyone shall be delivered, written in the book. And that's, what, that's what Daniel is talking about. He's saying that there's going to be a time of trouble, a time of suffering, a time of sorrow, a time of perplexity, a time when the people of the world will not know where to turn because the church is gone. And because, uh, you know, they have despised the gospel, the good news. And now the great tribulation comes upon them at the end of the age. And then they will suffer as no suffering had ever been before. Again, this will come upon the people of the world suddenly. Because a uh, you know, rapture takes place suddenly. And then after some time, they'll have some explanation. Those people, well, they've gone away. We don't know what happened. And then life will continue with them. Just like after Enoch had been taken away, life continued with the people until the flood came. When the rapture had taken place, life will continue. They'll rationalize. Uh, you know, this has happened, that has happened. Those fanatics are gone. And those uh, people, uh, you know, after Elijah went, they they were looking for Elijah. They told Elisha, maybe he's dropped on one mountain somewhere, in the valley somewhere. The people of the world will be like that. And then this time of the great tribulation will come upon them unprepared. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. It says, But of the times and the season, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are perfectly known that the day of the Lord, that's that day of devastation, that day of doom, and that day of darkness, for the day of the Lord shall come. It cometh as a thief in the night, and when they shall say, Peace and safety, when they eventually settle down, now, and they overcome the shock of the rapture. And then you see peace and safety now. It says then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. And then eventually the Antichrist will show up. And then the Antichrist will say, I can't bring a solution for you. He will come like a lamb, like the prince of peace. And then when he gets on the throne, he'll speak like a dragon. And then it will be terrible for the people of the world at that time. Thank God I will not be here. I say, thank God I will not be here. You know, this is not the time to slumber and sleep and be idle. This is not the time to, uh, you know, just uh, brush up the word and say, what are they saying? It's coming. It's coming. If you miss the rapture, you'll take part in the great tribulation. If you're not going to be in the great tribulation, you'll get ready for the rapture. Somebody there is getting ready. 
you'll be saved and sanctified and made holy and live the righteous life like Enoch lived in Jesus name I'm looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 3 let no man deceive you by any means nobody will deceive you all these religious uh, false prophets will not deceive you in Jesus' name. All the perpetrators of false doctrine will not, de they will not deceive you in Jesus' name. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away force. What does that mean? A falling away. Churches are falling away from such doctrine. The people who believe salvation before, they no more preaching salvation. And those who believed holiness, sanctification before, they have abandoned that doctrine of sanctification. They say falling away. Those who believe the power of God uh, for a holy vessel and for sanctified saints, they no more preaching that. And those who believe that you live straight, one man, one wife, until death do us part, they are not no more preaching that. And those who believe before that worldliness makes somebody an enemy unto God. They no more preaching that. They say falling away. I pray that you as an individual you'll not fall away. Your family will not fall away. Your local church will not fall away. And our church at large entirely will, will not fall away in Jesus name. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away force and that man of sin, the Antichrist shall be revealed, the son of perdition that's the Antichrist who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God that's the Antichrist or that is worship, that's the Antichrist and he says as that uh, uh, so that he see he as God as seated in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He says, no, I'm the Christ, I'm the God. They don't need to worship any other God. Thank God I will not be here. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know, watch withholded, that he might be revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity does already work, only he. Only he who now letteth, who now hindereth, who now prevents, will prevent, will let, until he be taken out of the way. You see, the church will be taken out of the way before the great tribulation really comes proper. And before the Antichrist will begin to unleash all his terror on the world, Christ will have taken us out of here. Christ would have removed his own church because that's what he said. He said, I tell you that if you believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. That's the rapture. That's the rapture. It's going to take the church away before the time of this great tribulation. In verse 8 it says, and Day and then shall the wicked, that wicked one, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's at his second coming after the great tribulation. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, talking about the Antichrist, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. The people who perish, not because they didn't hear the truth, they didn't have the love for the truth relish for the truth, desire for the truth. They didn't embrace the truth. They heard each they shrugged their shoulders and they put it over and they said, no, and I'm not interested in that. If you're not interested in the gospel, you'll be interested in the Antichrist. The Antichrist will come and then you'll be swept away in the devastation, destruction and doom of that time because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for that cause, for that reason, for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, and that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I pray you'll not be here at that time. Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13. 
We're talking about the period of suffering and the period of the great tribulation. It's talking about that now in Isaiah chapter 13. And we're looking at verse 6. How are ye? For the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them, and they shall be in pain as a woman that traveleth. They shall be amazed one at another, and their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. It tells us in verse, uh, in verse 10, uh, for the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. And then he goes on describing the terrible days of the great tribulation. I pray you'll escape. You see how the amen is going down? Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. A time of devastation, destruction, and doom coming upon this world. In Joel chapter 2, reading from verse 1, blew ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is near at hand. Look at verse 11. And the Lord shall utter. His voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? And who can abide it? Hold on to those words. Who can abide it? A time of terrible suffering, great suffering. Who can abide it? We're looking in at Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Who can abide it? Revelation chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 13. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Who shall be able to stand? It's going to be a time of great devastation. In fact, at that time, people prefer to die. But death will not come. They will not be able to commit suicide. Because the suffering will be so intense and so terrible. Look at Revelation chapter 9 verse 6. Revelation chapter 9 verse 6. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. Terrible. That men will prefer to die. If they died, they will go to hell. But all the same, they will go through that great tribulation in great suffering. In those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. And shall desire to die. And death shall flee from them. I told you on the one hand, God's wrath is upon the world. I told you, second, Satan's indignation is upon the wrath. And then the third thing, the Antichrist in terror will also be terrorizing the world. Everything coming from three directions and piling upon the people of the earth. At the time of the great tribulation, the only remedy is that you will not be here. I said the only remedy is that you will not be here. You know, there are some people that say, so, you know, the church will go through the great tribulation. 
how can you leave your bride? Because Christ is the bridegroom. And he knows that the wrath of his own father is going to be poured upon the world. And the Antichrist is going to terrorize the world. And Satan is going to bring wrath upon the world. And then he'll leave his bride here. No, he'll take the bride away. The bridegroom is coming. Christ is coming. And then he'll take us away out of this world before that time of terrible devastation comes upon the world in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. And I'm reading here from verse 16. Revelation chapter 13. We're looking at verse 16. And he causes all, this is Antichrist, not both small and great, rich and poor, and free and bound, to receive the mark in their, in their right hand or in their forehead. There will be the mark of the Antichrist. Then he goes on to say, and that no man might buy or sell, save except he that had the mark of the name of the beast, of the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That is the Antichrist, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. That's six, six, six. You'll not be here to get that mark. In chapter 14, verse 9, chapter 14, verse 9, it tells us about that period. It says, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man, any man, if any man worship the beast and his image, or receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, what will they receive the mark? Because you cannot buy food. You cannot, will not be attended to in the market. You'll not be able to educate children. You'll not be able to buy anything or sell anything except you have the mark. And if you have the mark, you're doomed forever. The only remedy is that you'll not be here at that time. That when the rapture takes place, you would have gone. And that means you are saved. That means you are sanctified. That means you are living a holy life. That means like Enoch, like Elijah. You are walking with the Lord continually without any interruption. And then you are going to miss this great tribulation. And it says, if any receives the, the mark in the forehead and right hand, the same shall drink in verse 10 of the wrath of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the the cup of his indignation and he shall be he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up how long tell me out loud say it with conviction the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and they have no rest once they get to hell they have no rest and there is no release from that suffering. They have no rest. It is not purgatory. You know, you come out, that's a lie of, uh, you know, those people. There's no purgatory anywhere. And they have no rest day nor night. Who worship the beast and his image. And whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. I pray the Lord will save you and shelter you and protect you from that day which is coming in Jesus name. Number one, there is the rapture which is what the church is waiting for now. And then, number two, after the rapture, there'll be the great tribulation. And after the great tribulation, Christ will come. And when Christ comes, he will set up his millennial reign. He will bind the devil. And the devil will be in the bottomless pit. We're looking at Revelation chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven. I mean, the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him how many years? 
a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years shall be fulfilled and after that he must be loose a little season and I saw the thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was a given unto them and uh, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the watch of God and we shall not worship the beast neither his image neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and they lived that's talking about the tribulation people those people among the Jewish people and others that will say uh-huh whatever the suffering I know that if you take the mark you're doomed forever and ever and at that time they seek the Lord and they seek the grace of God because anytime anywhere any period whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved and now they are saved and it says they died they were beheaded because of their stand and because they will not compromise if at that time of the great tribulation there are people that will not compromise if at that time when it will be terrible devastation and doom and damnation there are people who will say uh -huh, since we're here now we're here and we're not going to compromise and they will be beheaded I about this time nobody is beheading you there now in your local church in your local district or community you'll take your stand I said you'll take your stand and then it says and they lived and they reigned with Christ a thousand years that's the millennial reign millennial reign it's after that millennial reign when I come to the great white throne judgment that brings us to point number three the sentence at the great white throne judgment we're looking at chapter 20 from verse 11 and I saw the and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it and from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away and these and the and it says there was no place for them. There's a great judgment because all the nations and all the people they'll gather before the Lord. And it says it's a great white throne. I saw God sitting on that great white throne, and it said, The day of final judgment has come. Look at verse 12. And I saw the dead, and I saw the dead. All the people that were dead from the beginning of the world, even until that time, they'll, they'll be summoned before the Lord. And it says, they are small and great, the children and the men, the children and their parents, the mothers and the fathers, and everyone that has spun the gospel, rejected the gospel, pushed away the gospel, everyone that said, I don't have any time for salvation now, uh, eternal life. I don't have time for that now. A change of life. I don't have time for that now. He said, I saw them. I saw them. I saw them. The dead, small and great, they stood before God, stand before God, and the books were open. That's a record going on and there's a, you know there's an all-seeing eye of God is omniscient it knows all things everything you do in the secret everything you do in the open it follows after you there will be no argument on that day because it says the books were open the book of records about every man that lives about everyone that book was open and then it says which another book was open which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were, which were, I can't hear you. I want to hear the church reaching. They were reaching down. And then there's so seen eye that looks at you every time. There's a personality following you all the time. And everything, he knows your thoughts, he knows your lives. He knows those who are really saved. And that I call you brother so and so, sister so and so. Thank you, brother. Thank you, my sister. Uh uh. That's not going to do at that time because he knows those who are born again. He knows those who are in the book of life and he knows the people who are just there. We call them brothers and sisters and whatever we call them, they're not children of God. They're judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea, 
give up the dead which were in them, which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. What does that mean? At the present time, anybody that, uh, you know, is uh, not born again and he dies, he goes to hell. And now at that time, at the time of the great white throne judgment, hell will release the body and the spirit. And then resurrection will release the body and the body and the soul and the spirit will be joined together. And then you appear before the almighty God whole, as, as a whole person that is all the people those names are not in the book of life. And if your name had been in the book of life, you understand? If you go back into idolatry, you go back into sin, you go back into the pollutions of the world, the Lord said, whosoever has sinned against me, I'll take his name out of the book. You better rush back and rush back to Calvary and say, Lord, I come. And then he will forgive your sin, he will save your soul. And it says over here, and, and the sea gave up the dead which were in each. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged and they were judged and they were judged every man according to their works and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death death cast into the lake of fire that means death as a personality will not be able to kill anybody anymore because death now the death of death has come death of death has come that's why it says this is the second death and whosoever and whosoever bishop and whosoever overseer and whosoever a lay reader and whosoever a worker and whosoever denominational man and whosoever a professing Christian and whosoever a so-called Christian and whosoever the one who is an angel outside and a devil inside and whosoever the one that everybody is saying is a good man is a good woman and whosoever preacher and whosoever was not found reaching in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The final has now come. The final has now come. But then when they are all abandoned and banished in the lake of fire, you as a child of God, you saved and sanctified and steadfast in the Lord, you'll be in heaven forever and ever. I'm talking about somebody that said you'll be in heaven forever and ever. Because we're told in Revelation chapter 21, verse 7, he that overcometh, that's me. He that overcometh, I said that's me. Whatever little challenges come, you know, I will overcome. I said I will overcome. I can't hear everybody, I will overcome. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my people but, verse 8, I'm afraid of what they will say if I'm born again, but a fearful. I'm afraid of so and so if I fully, entirely, totally surrender my life to the Lord and then I live a clean life, a clear life, a pure life, a holy life, a righteous life, a sanctified life. I'm afraid of what they will say, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the unmongers, those are the adulterers, fornicators and the sorcerers, those are the people in occultism and the, and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which born into a fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, what's the effect of all this on you? You hear the word of God concerning the rapture. What's the effect? You hear the word of God concerning the great revolution. What's the effect? You hear the word on the great white throne judgment. What's the effect? Let me show you the effect on uh, Daniel when he saw that thing that was coming. When he saw that judgment was coming. The effect on him. Uh, look at Daniel chapter 7. And I'm reading the final verse there. Daniel chapter 7. And we're looking at verse 28. Daniel chapter 7. Seven, verse 28, here too is the end of the matter, of the revelation, of the vision that he saw. You know the vision that he saw? Let me refer you back to verse 9. In verse 9 it says, it says in chapter 7, chapter 7, we're looking at verse 9 so you all understand what he's commenting about. He said, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose 
garment was white as snow, and the air of his head like a pure wool. Then he says his throne was like the fairy flame, and his wheels of bony fire, and fairy flame stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, and the judgment was set. And the judgment was said. The judgment was said. And uh, tell me. And the books were open. When Daniel saw that, look at the effect. Verse 28. He that too is the edge of the matter. As for me, Daniel, as for me, Daniel, my cogitations, my thoughts, my rumination, turning it over my mind, thinking about it, picturing it, and see what will happen. My cogitations much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. You see, these are people that profit by the word. They hear the word on the rapture. They hear the word on the great tribulation. They hear the word on the great white throne judgment. They think about that and they picture that and they visualize that. They say this is what is coming. They're troubled in their heart. The spirit of God points out this and this and this. How about this? And they go on their knees and they search all that. Look at the effect when somebody saw the reality of what really happened. Maybe he heard of it, but you know he didn't pay attention to it. Now he saw the reality. I'm looking at Luke chapter 16. The effect when we hear of such revelations like this. We're looking at Luke chapter 16 and I'm reading from verse 24. Luke chapter 16, we're reading from verse 24 and he cried and said Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. The reality had now come. Revelation had now become reality. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received uh, thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from thence, from hence to you, cannot, and neither can they pass uh, unto us that will come from thence. Then said he, I pray thee. Therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that thee may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. You see that effect? That's the effect on the people that really believe the word. They know that the rapture is happening. It's going to happen. And their relatives are not saved. And their neighbors are not saved. And the people around them are not born again. And the people in their state, in their nation, in their community, they are not born again. They want to do something about that so that anybody they know will not pass through the great tribulation. That ought to be the effect on you. That you look at the people around you who do not know the Lord and then you go to them and you want them of the wrath to come. We're looking at Second Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 10 and verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore, knowing therefore, you know about the rapture, knowing therefore, you know about the great tribulation that is coming, knowing therefore, you know about the great white throne judgment that will come upon the people of this world, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, we go out to them, we look, we look at them, everybody you see on the street will say, will this one make the rapture? Is this one born again? Is this one a child of God? I want you talk to your friend. 
it. You're asking yourself, is he born again? Is he a child of God? Is he sanctified? And when you see your relatives, the first question that comes to you, what you are thinking about is, rapture may take place about any time. And the great revelation will come immediately after the rapture. Is this my neighbor? Is this my friend? Is this my relation born again? You see, is she sanctified? Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord will persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God and I trust also are made manifest on, into in your own consciences. I pray that that day will not come upon us unawares in Jesus name. You'll be ready. Your wife will be ready. Your husband will be ready. Your children will be ready. Your parents will be ready. And then your neighbors will go and tell them a time of suffering is coming that had never been in this world before. Get ready and get born again. You'll tell them, if you're not born again, this is the time to give your life to the Lord and be born again. If you're born again you're now already, this is the time to be sanctified. Look at your heart and let the Lord purge and purify and make you holy and sanctify you. And then as that has happened, you'll receive the power of the Holy Ghost to go and witness and to go and tell other people that they will escape the judgment that is to come. Let's rise up and take this to the Lord in prayer. Let the knowledge have some impact in your life. Let it have effect in your life. Look at Daniel. Daniel said, when I saw all this, when I saw the matter, when I saw the revelation, the cogitations of my heart, the meditations of my heart, the ruminations of my heart troubled me. And then he said, I urge understanding. Do something about this. Do something about this. And let your life be ready for the coming of the Lord. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.